Hello, everyone. My name is Old Man Saxon. I'm a rapper. I'm also a professor of rap at the Musicians Institute in Los Angeles, California. In July 2013, I quit my job testing video games in order to pursue music full time, because testing video games is so hard. <laughs> um, needless to say, <laughs> by July 2014, I was completely broke. I barely had enough money for gas, let alone rent. I was officially a struggling artist. I'm here today to talk about the year I spent living in my car and the lessons I learned about creating and sharing during that time. Now, it's important to, to know that I made a conscious decision to sleep in my car. By no means did I have money. I remember looking at my bank account and having 23 cents in the checking account, and then looking at my saving account and I had 15 cents, and I was like, yeah, I'm glad I saved that 15 cents. But I did have... Um, a community that would have allowed me to stay on their couch for as long as I needed or an extra bedroom. And if I would have told my mom, she would have done whatever she could to help me. She always has, but I kept it a secret from everyone. I, I didn't want to be a burden on anyone. If anything, I wanted to be a burden on myself for a little bit. And at the same time, my friends were, from college were taking time off work to travel the world and find themselves. And I was doing the same thing, just a slightly different route. In a way, I was manufacturing my own rite of passage. Now, to give you an idea of a typical 24 hours during this time, I would usually wake up in my back seat sweating, because LA is no joke. If I didn't find a tree to park under, that meant the sun was my alarm clock for the day. I'd usually spend my days at two places. One was this gym on Hollywood Boulevard, the other was a park on Hollywood Boulevard. I didn't go far. The gym and the park felt like home, because I saw a lot of people there in a similar situation that I was in. At the gym, I saw people there for pretty much the, the entire day, in the same clothes as the day before, not even gym clothes, like jeans and boots and sweaters, not even working out, just sitting in front of their locker room trying to get out of the sun for a bit, and I can understand that. At the park, where I wrote all my songs for my album, I saw people sleeping and eating and changing in their cluttered back seats, just like I was. And it was weird because we all knew that we had this thing in common, but we never talked about it. We were all kind of alone in our little community. We were ashamed of our truth. After, after the park, I'd go to work at this little restaurant. I started out washing dishes, and it was great working at a restaurant because that means I got to eat at least one free meal a day. Um, but I ended up washing dishes and working my way up to become a waiter. And that was a weird dynamic because I had to put on this smile and act like I cared about people's carbonara, even though I, I knew that uh, an hour later I was going to be driving around looking for a parking spot, hopefully under a tree. After I find it, I write some more music, but I couldn't get too tired because I had to set up my sleeping arrangement, which means putting the seats down and hanging up my clothes on the window so people wouldn't be able to see in. But that didn't really stop the sun from coming in, so I'd wake up again, sweating, another day. Now, I think the scariest part of that time had nothing to do with sleeping in the back of my car. It had to do with telling people about my situation. I mean, there were some crazy times, but I'll tell you after the show. Catch me outside. How about that? Um, but the scariest times were telling people. Like, I would always have to ask someone first, like, where do you live? So that I could say that, that I lived on the other side of town, hopefully someplace they weren't familiar with. I remember I learned that early because I got caught once. He was like, yeah, where do you live? I was like, Silver Lake. I was like, he was like, yeah, me too. Where do you stay? I was like, oh, it's like a house with doorknobs, I think. It's a bunch of doorknobs. Um, <laughs> and I also, whenever my mom would call, I'd have to lie to her and be like, yeah, I'm staying with a friend. And that wasn't true. So when I started writing this album about living in the back of my car, while I was living in the back of my car, I was confronted with sharing that with an audience, a hip-hop audience that's used to this, the glamour and glitz of a rapper's lifestyle, you know? And in a capitalist society that we live in, where you are defined by what you have, I was in a position where I was defined specifically by what I didn't have. I was homeless, which is why I don't use the term, because I think it's also crazy to let someone else define what a home is to me. I had a home, it was a mobile home, it moved, I had a home. I think I had to lie, I felt like I had to lie early in my rap career to tell a meaningful story, to, to have fans. I had lyrics like, I got money in the bank, everything's all right, let's go big all night. So insecure, because I didn't have money in the bank and everything wasn't all right. But I, I realized that I wanted to be more truthful with myself, but telling the truth can be really hard. And maybe that's not necessarily true, because the truth is the easiest thing to remember. You know, it's actually pretty easy to tell the truth. It's sharing the truth that is hard. And I thought people would perceive me as a failure, because who wants to listen to a broke rapper? You know, I thought 
talking about the day-to-day aspects of my life wouldn't be good enough. It wouldn't be a viable form of entertainment. But I'm here today to talk about how I was wrong. Now, I think it's important to get a little bit of hip-hop history. Um, Hip-hop was born out of the magnificent ability for young people to find their voices by using them. Young people that believe that to be human is to have a story to tell, and to tell that story by any means necessary. But if you're a hip-hop head, you realize there's been a huge shift in how rap is being shown these days. It's, in my opinion, it's defined by apathy, consumerism, and comparison. You know, I don't care about anything because I got money, and because I got money, I get power, and because you know, I get power, I get all the women. You know, that's cool. The more extravagant you are, the more likely you are to be noticed, like peacocks. And <laughs> we lost touch with the origins of the music. Um, and we can all agree, money, power, women, that's, a, you know, that's something that we hear in rap a lot, right? That's from the movie Scarface, right? People don't know this, but Scarface is one of the most influential movies in hip-hop culture. There's been documentaries made about its impact on the culture. Hundreds of rappers have referenced him in their songs, and if you watch any early 2000s MTV Cribs episode, you will see a Scarface poster in a rapper's home, I guarantee it. Over the, like, one of the main themes of this movie is <coughs> the connection between acquiring the money, achieving a state of power, and then getting women. To paraphrase the quote, it's first you get the money, then you get the power, then you get the women, right? Two things are interesting about this. One is the idea that first you get the money. Before anything else, you get that money first. Second is the direct and obvious correlation between money and power, as if power is something that happens outside of yourself. And rappers definitely took notice because the music became more about the success than the struggle. Um, in fact, whenever you do hear about poverty in hip-hop, it's usually spoken of retroactively, in past tense. So some of my favorite songs, Schoolboy Q has a song called Bless. It starts out with, what's life for a person like me? Living out his backpack every night needed a new place to sleep. Needed. One of Drake's most popular songs. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Even Biggie said, birthdays was the worst days. Now we sip champagne when we thirsty. Hey, these are some of my favorite songs from some of my favorite artists. I'm not going to lie. But, I'm not, and I'm not here to say that hip-hop's dead or, you know, there's a problem with it, but I think the disconnect for me is that now we're in a time where anyone with the ability to rhyme and an internet connection can share their music or their story to the public, but the stories haven't become more diverse. More quantity didn't result in more diversity, and I have two reasons why that is. One is the idea that people want to speak their fantasy into fruition. If they talk about the Lamborghini and the girls, then eventually they'll get it. Second is that people don't want to seem sad and boring. Sad, boring people don't get invited to the party. We don't want them here. Now, I told you before, I teach professor of rap at the Musicians Institute. I don't know what that means either. I just show up to work and they pay me. No, but honestly, it's like, it's a pretty hard job. It, it has to do with trying to make students be themselves in, uh, in a genre where authenticity is a major rule that shouldn't be broken. So, I, <coughs> students come to me with their own original lyrics and I'll read them and I'll be like, you're like the richest person on earth. Like, that's crazy. Like, how do you have all this money? But I know that they're lying because, I mean, they're talking about their Bentley and their models and the millions of dollars in their account. But I know that they're rushing out of my class to catch the bus home to take care of their mom before their next shift at Burger King. And they don't realize that that's their story. They don't want to seem boring. They want to get invited to the party. But in order to get invited to the party, you need to bring something of value. And I feel like one of the reasons we lie, not only in hip hop, but in life, is that we feel like we're the only ones in pain. But they don't realize that there's a lot of people out there that could benefit from knowing that they're not alone. And because of my students' wild imagination, we have this exercise we do in class, where I have them write two verses. One verse where everything's absolutely true. The other verse where everything just has to be a lie. You can rap about a dragon on rims, I don't care. Every time, I have, to this day, I've only loved the true verses. There's a unique personal point of view. These lyrics are about where they went today, how they got there, what time they woke up, their moms, their jobs, their feelings, their broken hearts. And these stories are way more relatable than the story about the Bentley because we all have moms and feelings, but we don't all have Bentleys. And then I think about what Scarface says is, first you get the money. Before anything else, you get that money first. And then I see the problem that my students have with telling their story as is. They'd rather wait until they're they achieve this status and then walk around looking all cool, talking about what they have in present tense. And I tell them, this is not an option. The big mantra in my class is do not wait. Do not wait 
for your life to be perfect until you have arrived before you write and share your story. And my students have a problem with this because the rags part of the rags to riches story is really unattractive to tell, especially for them in a Facebook generation where you only advertise the good parts of your life, right? <coughs> I'm sorry. So, <laughs> don't look at that. Um, so you could imagine when I decided to write about the year I spent living in my car that I would be a little nervous. Actually, that was right, yeah. That I'd be a little nervous. And because I wasn't talking about how much I had, you know? I was using my lyrics to showcase the most mundane aspects of my life. Lyrics like, 6 a.m., wake up. All alone, like, what can your boy say? Shower, shave, is taking the whole day. Saying in my song, asking, can I use your restroom? Because that was a common phrase that I was using during that time. Admitting that I was choked up while I was writing it. Didn't think my life would get so darn trifling. Living like mice and men. Hoping it all gets right again, looking like I crawled out of a chimney. Balls in my vicinity, hoping they remember me, but stuck in anonymity. These were lyrics that were not about what I had, and I was admitting that I didn't have money or what my peers would classify as power. But something really amazing happened when I released the video, and the, the, album, or the video went viral. I had people from all over the world contact me saying that this too was their life that they were sleeping in the back of their car, working and trying to make ends meet, from the man who said he was going to reconnect with his family after 10 years of living on the streets, to the woman who said she was five months pregnant sleeping in the back of her car with a full-time job, to the man who said he was contemplating suicide until my music helped him through this dark time. I told you that the reason I think we lie is because we feel like we're the only ones in pain, but these are real reactions from real people that make me feel less alone and more confident to speak my truth and be accepted when I do. I can only imagine this increasing the quality of my music and deepening the trust in my, my spirit and myself and proving that the risk was well worth it. I used to think that my story wasn't valuable because it wasn't like everyone else's, but that's crazy because now I realize my story is valuable because it's unique. And then you think about how I could, we consider collector's items valuable because there's not a lot of them made. My story isn't boring, it's a collector's item. That's what it is. I think that living in my car was probably one of the most selfish things I've ever done, but sharing this experience is probably the most selfless. It's a, it's a true mashup that explores my rite of passage from a boy to a man and a growing up from a fan to an artist in my own right. Doing this, I saw the beautiful alignment between what I do, say, think, and feel, and that is an amazing feeling. Now, I know the TED audience doesn't encompass everyone in the world, but if I was to give a piece of advice that wasn't just for rappers and storytellers, it would be that to understand that there's beauty in the mundane. How you perceive a situation goes hand in hand in how you experience that situation. I mean, I spent a year sleeping in my car, changing in the back seat, and using only public restrooms. And I consider it one of the best times of my life. I realize that the common denominator in all of my experiences is me. I realize that the more personal the story, the more universal. That the more terrifying something is to say, the more impact it will have. And maybe the more resistance you have to something, the more you should pay attention to it. This experience makes me want to help my students who don't want to tell their story because they want to get invited to the party. I say to them and to you, do not wait to get invited to the party. You are the party. Thank you. <laughs>